All right. No day, <clears throat> excuse me, another day alive. Another day alive for all of us here today and more, right? As per usual, the background sound is the adventure pooch chewing on her elk bone of the day. I save all the bones for everything I harvest and then uh, chop them up in a treat size pieces and put them in bags in the freezer. So we have a little routine. We go out, feed the horses, do our shit around here, come inside the shop, close the door, throw her a bone. And then I do this and then carry on. Now, um, the bear, you know, it's funny with the hunting thing. I love, uh, obviously hunting's a major part of my life. Um, guiding, huge part of my life. Um, I prefer to, I'm a huge fan of finding the most unbelievably huge, um, specimen I can, no matter what the species is, but on the same token, I'm not a fan of the tape measure. It's like, it's kind of weird, right? It's really confusing, contradicting. I'm anti, I shouldn't say anti, I'm just, I try to, it's a tough line to, to go down. Being passionate about it, wanting everyone to be good at it, trying to share knowledge, possibly being good at it, and not, and trying to not come across as, is it's an ego thing. I get what I'm trying to say. I don't, I do not see the macho thing in hunting like a lot of people who do not hunt see. I don't see the contest that a lot of people see. Oh yeah, why don't you make it more fair? I don't even know where the contest thing came in. It's not a contest, you're just getting your food, man. <laughs> you're just getting your food, you know? That's it, when it comes down to it, you're just getting your food. Doesn't need to be difficult. It doesn't need to be extra difficult. It doesn't need to be what some people think is a contest. It's not a contest. Just getting your freaking food naturally. That's what it boils down to with me. Then when it comes to the part where I prefer to hold out for the largest example, more bang for your buck, way more meat. Right? Treating the herd, treating the wildlife population as though it is your own personal food source. Right? You don't want to annihilate it. You want to try not to take out the females. You want to let them live long, free, healthy, and take them, harvest them when it's time. A lot of people might think, oh yeah, well, so, you know, those big old bulls, etc. They're not good to eat. It's better as, they're not as good as the young ones. Yeah, so most of the time, the younger bucks, bulls, whatever, they are a little more, a little more tender. Same flavor. You can't change the flavor. A little more tender. But, I've proven it to myself for years, as long as you treat the game meat correctly, it's just as delicious. There you go. It's all how you treat the meat. So I have no problems preferring the older Passer Prime specimens when I can pull it off. Now anyway, sharing the story, what I'm getting at is when you deliver the story, you, it's a lot of people... There's a lot of competitive hunters out there that just get their back up when they see you with an enormous example of the species you're hunting, right? They get the bad guy. Jealous for some unknown bizarre reason. It kind of drives me bonkers. But I try to keep the, I don't want there to be any superhero or you're a hero aspect to a story, to an experience. It's just another experience in life. I'm no different than anybody. I hope you're picking up what I'm trying to put down. There, I do not hunt or share the experiences to get stroked or show that I'm some kind of tough um, hero, which a lot of people watch. So I've been trying to explain to people when they get off the bush plane, hey, just, just so you know, if you're a complete moron and I get you the world's record elk tomorrow, you're still going to go home a moron. I'm always the first one to express to everyone, it doesn't matter what you do in the woods, what you harvest, that's not going to change you. All right, that's gonna put, that's not putting you up here, never will, it's not possible. The only way you can get up here is by treating people with respect and helping people. That's it, it's the only way. I'm babbling, not enough caffeine yet. So I'm giving you that pre heads up before I share the rest of my experience I had the past couple days, okay? There's no, there's no beating the chest when, for me when it comes to outdoor experiences ever, although some people may because they feel threatened in a way, they're going to read that into it anyways. I'm just giving the heads up. I'm just babbling. I wasn't big on sharing the story yet because 
yeah, it's just the, the self-shame that I have to get through first. Because, yeah, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed that I, I made my poor shot. I'm ashamed of it. I was still getting over that part of it with me. You know what I mean? I just didn't need to be reliving it yesterday, word for word, right away, like it was some boasting story. Can't wait to brag, it was, which is not the case. It's just the shame sandwich that I'm eating. And then once I've beat myself up enough, Calm down, got the adrenaline dump out of me. All right, now I can hang out and I'll share what happened. It's just another fact of life. It's all there is to it. It doesn't matter who you are or what you do in life. You're going to screw up sometimes. And that's how you get better. Everybody's going to get their, their turn. Every single outdoors person gets their turn at losing that fish, screwing up with the net on a monster fish for a buddy, missing altogether on that shot of a lifetime, or even worse, making the placement not so good. It sucks. And it's a, it's a shit sandwich you gotta eat and swallow. No way out of it. So that's what I was doing the past couple days too. Anyway. Yeah, so this bear, I found him and one other bear like two years ago. You guys have seen this bear on various trail camera videos that I have. And it took me a couple years of when I had time trying to figure out where he might go, where he might be. I figured out where he was in the summertime. I knew there's no way this one of these two bears was an ancient I floated the river, I hiked, I set up cameras on my spare time. I'm making too much of a display about it, it's just something I want to do. I'm like, all right, I'm in the zone. I'm going to harvest a bear. I got a dog. We're going to utilize, I got all the edible meat off that carcass. We're going to use a lot of it for healthy dog food. You see the price of dog food? People are going to go, oh my God, you do that to feed a dog? Well, what do we do to feed ourselves? What do you think goes into pet food in the pet store? If you can see the amount of dog shit and lives that go into dog, in, into, into pet food, especially the vegans, right? The vegans that have pets, <laughs> they kill me. You only knew what's going down your animal's mouth, down their throat. Anyway, it's very valuable, um, the harvest of this animal for us at this, this home. Anyway, I made my shot about I don't know. It, I just can't believe. It. I mean, my my final fatal shot was a perfect bullseye, and it was only that far away from the previous, the very first arrow. I just can't figure it out. But whatever. I screwed up in the first shot, and I heard it go off into the thick shit. And I thought I heard it near me, about thirty yards away. I'm like, perfect. And there's only about I don't know. There might have been ten minutes seeing light left. I gotta get it perfect. I'll go back and find him in the morning. So I went back alone in the morning uh, with my bow, obviously. And uh, I found one spot where there's some blood under a big, big, huge tree like this falling down on an angle. And there's blood underneath it. And there's a dark tunnel going right underneath that thing. You can see where it laid down there, but moved. I'm like, oh no. And it's absolutely pouring rain. And I can't tell if it stopped there and paused and went into that tunnel, which bears normally do when they're mortally wounded. They dig themselves in the tiniest hole. It's amazing. And I'm sure a lot of bears get lost just because of that fact. And they don't. Anyway, so uh, I'm like, well, I got to go home and get a flashlight. And I'd better get the dogs. I'm not crawling in there on my hands and knees after this thing, not knowing if it's still alive or not. And I looked thoroughly everywhere. I found half of my arrow, which had broken off. But it was too, a little too much for my liking, which shows not as much penetration. And then, um, I thought, okay, and it's, I mean, it is raining so hard, it's ridiculous. So I went home, got the dog, came back. She is not trained to track. Took her right to that spot where the blood is. She's smelling it like it. She already hates bears with a passion. And she's not growling. And we look in the hole, that's, that bear's not in the hole. We went and there's blowdowns everywhere. We went all through all the tangle, all the blowdowns, all the dark holes and caverns. It's all these bear beds everywhere. Nothing. I'm like, yeah, oh, shit. All right, let's go back to where the blood was. Went back there. Boom, she jerks me into the left into this thick shit that I would have never dreamt on, of attempting to go into. And uh, I'm crawling on my hands and knees trying to get under branches following her. And then I can kind of get up on my knee again, like sitting up on my knee, on my foot and knee. And then I got to literally get down on my hands and knees again to get farther in this tunnel of shit. So you can imagine what I had to, 
was going through my mind of how am I going to get to a safe route <laughs> right here if all hell breaks loose. And no sooner I started to think that and bah, 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 like the, the canine time bomb went, the canine shotgun went off. And I looked forward and now you can see this face looking at us about 12 or 10 feet away maybe, eight. And he's just sitting there growling at us. I'm like, uh oh. All right, um, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm, I'm holding on to her like she's trying to get at this bear and I cannot let go of her and I'm tangled up in this shit. I got, you know, everything happens really quick. It's like, is he coming for us? I can't get out of here. Uh oh, and then um, there's no way I can even get him. I mean, I'm in a, you might as well have been sitting in the middle, middle of a wire SOS pad. So the bear, I don't think he's feeling too good. He's sitting there staring us down, growling. I think he's backed into the corner. I backed out. And I noted that there was a hole about like this through the thick stuff. I actually got video of him. I stopped. When I came back in, I took video of him. I tied the dog up. I snuck into my hands and knees again. Cause, but I thought that I would possibly be able to get a perfect shot right there. That's all I had. And then, uh, he, I could just see the black fur in there. And then I made a noise because it's so, it's raining so hard. The noise was just like, you might as well have been in a waterfall of the noise, okay? And the wind's going this way. So he can't hear me and he can't smell me and his head's down. And I crawled in there again to about, I think I got about 12 feet away, 14. I'm moving real slow, right? The dog's not barking. She's back. She's like, fired up. And then I was literally reaching ahead and snapping the slowly snapping branches off to try to create a hole where I could get my bow up without hitting anything and draw back and aim on that small window I saw. And then, uh, then what happened? I made another snap and I lifted its head up. And now I know exactly what I'm looking at. And that is the shoulder area that I'm looking at that one hole. Okay, here we go put his head back down and then I had to get put weight on my left foot which was driving me bonkers because there's a bunch of branches down there and I'm like man I do I snap one more branch he's gonna know so it's something's going down again and you, you got you had a little bit of adrenaline going on so I managed to do that and then I had to reach forward again and get this rose hip I think it's called rose hips one more branch and I had to reach forward towards him and I took my arrow off I'm trying to hook the branch with my arrow to pull it back to snap it off and then uh, I drew back. Hole is about as an angle. It was a hole shaped like a diamond on an angle, and I had to get as slow. And when I put my pin on it, I realized, oh shit, I might be shooting a little lower than I thought. Nope, this is all I got. Let her rip. So what I'm anticipating is I had a bullseye on this bear, and he's going to spin and chomp at the arrow and spin in those branches and give me a little time to back out while he perishes. Shot, skipped a branch a little bit whacked him <clears throat> and then he spins around roaring rah. and I'm not moving because I'm thinking he's he's only way out is towards me and I don't know if he's got a back route out so I'm backing up to make sure I can possibly reach up and grab a branch and climb up or whatever and then uh, he blasts through the thick stuff even deeper now the dog's going ape shit the second I shot the dog's going crazy so now I go back out to her, grab her by the leash. We went around the main trail, got around the thick stuff, and you can see the bushes moving where he's moving. You can hear him. He's pissed off. And then I can see the bushes are starting to come towards, the movement's starting to come towards us. I'm like, uh-oh. So I tied her onto a branch. Boom. He locks eyes on me, and he is pissed, and he's coming. He's not running. But he's looking at me and he is deliberately, he didn't turn away, he didn't go away. He's coming up the trail at me no matter what. This is all, this is all in a matter of seconds, you guys, all right? So um, I got a bow uh, arrow on my bow as fast as I could, drew back and put the pin right underneath his chin. And by then, I don't know what, he was three paces or something. Let her rip. Bam, shot him white square in the face with another arrow. You guys want to hear the story? Now he's really angry. And uh, whipping around. 
Dog's going ape shit. I got two arrows left. And then uh, I got back out. I backed away a little bit, got another and I can't get, I can't see anything in there. I can't see where he is. I can't get a hole in. He's thicker than shit still. <laughs> it's noisy from the rain. It's just all hell's breaking loose, right? I saw, I think he, because he is so, is this a bizarre thing to see that arrow hanging out of his head? But it didn't hit him in the sweet spot. It hit him over here. Didn't kill him. You guys wanted to hear the story. <sighs> Boom, he snaps that thing off. This goes to the right a little more. I go over wide and cutting him off. Not cutting him off, I'm following. He comes out to another opening, growling, looks at me again, gives me his shoulder, thumped him again. And then uh, and that was all she wrote. And that was the fatal blow. And then uh, down he went. We left, left him for a while. You always leave them for a while. And then in that stuff, especially grizzly bears. But anyway, so that's what happened. There you go. That's what happened. End of story. That was a heavy pack out, man. The sucker's head was wider than my pack frame. I got him completely skinned out. I could took all the meat off of that animal and I backpacked it out of there. End of story. Another successful hunt. And I'm going to be packing to go in another one after this. So, that's as about as matter of fact as I can deliver without somebody being threatened, thinking it's an egomaniac macho story, which it isn't. It's just another day in, the, in this lifetime. Another experience in this lifetime. And I feel still beating myself up. I can't. It just it takes... It, ta it, it sucks the excitement... And the sense of, what is, it, what is the sense of it? Your accomplishment of, you know, your, you accomplished that goal. I mean, it's two years. Two years trying to figure that one out. And I, you've seen all the videos of me taking you guys bear hunting with me in the spring. I let how many bears go and did not harvest one only because it wasn't the potential that I knew was there. Right? I know there's one way bigger. I know there's one way older. I'm not doing it. And all of that effort, time, and I screwed up the shot. So there you go. That's why I have my lack of enthusiasm. This when I put the glasses on the outside of the toque drives people bonkers. <laughs> That's why it just sucks my enthusiasm out of sharing it. All right, and I don't do it. I don't hunt to share my hunts like so many other people do. They just can't wait to get that kill and post it up on the internet and attain that apparent superhero status they think they're attaining. There's a babble. I'm done with the babble. All right. What have we got here? This is in the recent column. Experiences I am opening up about as they're there occur. As they occur, I'm sure you met. Dear Steve, a friend of mine who's a fellow hunter slash logger, shared your YouTube channel with me, which I now follow and watch as often as I can. It's given me the courage and help make the decision to share my experiences with anyone. So thank you for your channel. My experiences are as follows. That is freaking good news to me. I love that, especially in the logging community, the A-type, what you might call the A-type community, where guys, men, keep their mouth shut due to ridicule. It's freaking awesome that people are gonna open up no matter what. Beautiful. Number one, I was in my early 20s, currently 34, running a logging machine a dangle head processor, alone on night shifts, on the Mohawkum, spelling may be incorrect, Mohawkum Forest Service Road that used to connect Merritt with Boston Bar, BC. Hmm. We have a native logger friend who was in the same area and had that thing step on the back of his loader. Our logging truck was our logging truck. Sorry. Our logging block was just above Boston Bar, some steep country. I would drive up the Forest Service Road from Merritt after everyone had come down from day shift to avoid any conflict of vehicles as it was midwinter. On this particular afternoon, 
It was still light, and it was snowing. There was around a foot of fresh snow on the road early on in the drive. I was breaking trail as everyone had come down it. Snowed. Okay. I was breaking trail as everyone had come down, and it snowed that much over their tracks. Approximately three quarters of the weight of the block. I would remember around 40 kilometers. I saw tracks depending, depending down a steep incline beside the road, across the road, and drop down a go awfully steep hillside. Couple typos, no big deal. I think it meant a god awful steep hillside. Treed hillside. I got out just almost blank stared at these things for approximately five minutes before I could accept, before I accepted what I saw. They were perfect five toed footprints with almost flat feet, a big dip where the heel was, and approximately 20 inches long. Whoa. They looked just like what I seen when I looked into the casts taken up in Terrace and the ones down in California that prompted the Patterson and Gimlin to investigate. investigate. I walked up the bank to see if I could imitate the tracks. They were perfectly spaced in strides around five feet apart, with minor scuff marks in approximately three and a half foot deep of snow, where the foot entered the snow and left. I could not even lift my legs on 5'11", high enough to leave untouched snow. It looked like a typical plowed trench we leave, we leave in BC when walking through, trudging rather. There was nobody else up there that evening, and the nearest town was Merritt or Boston Bar. I contacted the BF shit show RO as I was a bit shook up and not a Sasquatch believer until this point. The email I got was that they believed me. But due to such high number of cases reported yearly in this area, they needed some more, some, sorry, they needed some more sort of evidence to launch an investigation. They don't need shit. Sorry for the little outburst. <laughs> Number two, in 2019, I was heli logging on the east side of Harrison Lake. We had the chopper stage of the second log dump on the east Harrison. One morning, my rigging partner and I flew to the block, got off the chopper and started flagging trees for the big bird, the S61 Kokorski. Yeah, a buddy of mine flies those, probably flew with you guys. As Richard was making, sorry, as Richard was working, he called me over to look at some odd sights. There was a kid's pool. 10 by 10 circular pool torn up with small claw marks on it. Along with that was an entire roll of roofing tarp unrolled with claw marks all through it as well. I only thought it was people growing pot, but that wouldn't explain how it was 3,000 feet up a vertical mountain with no roads. We thought maybe massive winds took the pool up there, but the closest beach was 10 kilometers away. That seems unfeasible. The last thing we found, impossible, was the 50 pounds of still rolled up roofing tarp. Rick, my partner, is First Nations and said he had heard tree, he had heard tree knocks in that East Harrison area often before he started his saws after the choppers left. He believes this is the doing of Sasquatch. I'm, not, I'm still not sure what this was about. Wow. Um, totally plausible. And what, what, what one thing for certain is East Harrison, that's like ground zero forever. And that's interesting to know that they do take that shit. You know as well as I do, it wasn't weed growers. They don't do that. Not that far. No way. But the unused, the, uh, the rolled up tarp, weird, right? So somebody obviously uh, grabbed shit and brought it home. Just like a lot of us men do with our shop, right? Throw shit in there because it might be useful one day. Maybe that's what they're doing. Crazy. Number three. This is now 2021. And I'm heli-logging at the head of Butte Inlet. <laughs> Here we go. Staying at Homathco Camp 
From there, one morning, I flew with my bullbucker approximately 30 minutes up the drainage west, hooked right into a valley, and were dropped in a glacial rock gorge. We gathered our gear, hiked two kilometers into where we're supposed to start building a helipad before commencing falling. As we entered the standing block, Clark calls me over. He is standing looking around at all the trees about 10 to 14 feet up. All the cedar bark at that height had been peeled off. All around the tree and not just this tree. But everyone could see. Everyone we could see for 100 yards. Holy shit. I started walking around and in the center of these strip trees I found a bedding spot that something had made as it was very steep slope as all heli slash hand fall slopes are something has dug into that bank and made a sleeping pad approximately five feet into the bank eight to nine feet long and has busted down spruce and cedar boughs then laid them down into what looked like a crude mattress I wish we could have kept this area preserved, but the company wasn't interested in this and had dollars to make. So my bull bucker and I were off to the next helipad to build another, another, oh, to, sorry, to build on another hillside. And two fallers came and spent the two weeks cutting. So nothing was left after except stumps. Steve, I know these things are real, but I do know our knowledge of them is substantial but also minuscule at the same time. I hope you share this and let me know what episode it's on. So maybe I could let some friends listen or give my email to anyone interested in reaching out. Thanks for your time. Wow. There you go. Golden for me, that's golden. Why? Because it's in my backyard. Also, why is it golden? Because we are now rapidly busting into what I think was once a bit of an impenetrable wall, which is the logging community, right? That's exciting for me because I know there's no effing way. There's no effing way. There isn't a piss load of forestry workers who aren't, they're just keeping their mouths shut. They're not saying shit. I'll guarantee it. Guaranteed. I'm sure you're watching this right now because that's a fresh email, right, man? So there you go. Share it. Make sure you share the piss out of this video with whoever you think may need that little bit of a kick in the ass to uh, share it up. Now, possibly there's going to be a lot of people in the forest industry, forestry industry, who are going to be a little insecure about sharing what they know because their employers, if they catch wind of it, they're going to probably think that F these guys are trying to get us shut down, right? So my message to all those potential forestry workers that are hesitant to share because of that factor, I'm not going to share your name. I'm not going to share the company. I'm not going to share shit. You don't even have to share with me that you're a logger. You can share with me, but I won't even share online that you're a logger working for so-and-so in this whatever area if that's the only thing stopping you from sharing what you know with us. All right, man and women? So if you are worried about losing employment from sharing your experience and you're in the forestry industry here in Canada, anywhere, I don't give a shit where, please be assured that whatever you need withheld is withheld. All right. I don't throw anybody under the bus ever. I don't give a shit how significant. I've had a video of one of these things forever. Ask not to share it. Haven't shared it. Military video, thermal video, my helicopter chasing the damn thing up the mountain. They asked not to share it publicly. I don't share it. So anyways, I'm just using that as an example to assure you that it's okay. It's safe, man. It's safe here to share it. All right. So let's hear what you got. Now the cedar bark thing. I found a huge cedar tree with all the bark stripped off about, I videotaped it. That I... That cedar bark was about 14 feet up from the ground. I mean, we're talking steep as shit. And that hill is directly across the valley from where I filmed those two lights way up in the mountain 
And it was like minus 20, 4.30 in the morning when I videotaped those lights and I showed them here. I just can't remember what video it's on. Sorry. But it's on my channel. And it's also across from where I heard scre a scream, but not the T-Rex type scream that, battle that rattles your rib cage. I just heard a vocal scream at first light on that other side of that valley. I found a footprint on that side of the valley. I've talked to a lot of people who have seen them on the other side of the valley from me. So what I'm saying is just right here to right here is where I found that cedar tree with the cedar bark stripped off and I shared it on here and of course people went look at this squirrels did it. obviously idiot have you ever been in the forest I'm like yeah yeah I've never seen that before <clears throat> and I also on the cedar strip thing I also spoke with they may be repeating this but oh well there's tens of thousands of new people here since I probably shared this story and somebody I ran into on a hunting forum <clears throat> they private messaged me when there was a thread going on about sasquatch and i was the biggest asshole on that thread because there's so many guys shitting on people coming forward and uh they had bought their dream home i believe in cranbrook or something in british columbia log home cattle ranch mediocre <clears throat> it's creek in the back 40. they were hearing screams out back alarming screams uh one time in the winter winter there was snow on the ground and the man went in the back 40 saw these massive huge tracks going across his cattle field in the back up to a huge cedar tree and he saw where it was stripping the bark way up off of the tree and then he could see the drag marks from what he thought was a fistful of bark beside these massive tracks going back in the timber and then later on i think in the spring or summer he was he went to the back hearing these screams went to the back from the house so he had to travel through timber till it busted open to the pasture and then he's the back of the pasture and this thing was screaming getting closer and closer and here it comes and it crossed diagonal in his cattle field right in front of him screaming huge massive reddish brown typical description and he and i recall he had anxiety because his wife was coming behind him and she hadn't come along yet so basically this thing's going that way he's here and his wife's supposed to be coming here but she never bumped into it and he was really bothered and troubled because this was their dream home their dream plan in life and now it was ruined for them because they were so so freaking terrified but anyway there you go the cedar bark is a thing but it's interesting Obviously, there wasn't any cedar bark mentioned in that makeshift pad, right? Now, now you go to the wondering why. You try to picture the details that you witnessed, your friend witnessed, and uh, you try to figure out why, what's up. All right, so I'm, I'm a huge, intelligent, human-like being. I'm obviously up in the middle of freaking nowhere. Why am I going through the absolute... Big time physical pain in the ass to dig out of the steep bank, go collect all this shit, put it on the ground, and stay up there, hidden up there. What am I hiding from? Why am I still up there? Why am I staying that high in altitude? Right? The majority of the game is going to be down below, unless you're into eating mountain goats every day. Especially in British Columbia. So that's in BC, up in that alpine. Mm. There's going to be mountain goats for sure. Maybe the odd bit group of mule deer but if you really want to get into food and vegetation and berries and shit which i don't think that's the motivation but i'm more wondering why i mean these beings can do some things physically that we can't wrap our brains around as in traveling why wouldn't it be easier just to rip down the slope to a nice flat patch in the forest with all that nice cushy moss under your ass why, why are you mo that's what my brain's doing why are you motivated to stay up there why that big effort to stay up there when you're already way far away from human beings what else is making you stay up there see what i'm getting at what's making you stay up there is it your ability to exit here rapidly by not straying too far away from that particular spot on a rock slope in a basin whatever is there a particular area up there that you can't stray too far from maybe or is there a threat from something that we're not familiar with that's making you stay up there and go through that effort to dig out that bank and make that bed and hang out there solo by yourself what's going on right what's going on that's that's the curious 
part. That's that's my curiosity has been knee jerked in that direction when I heard this when I hear this experience. The cedar bark. Why didn't you pull the? Why isn't the cedar bark pulled off in six inch wide strips? Why isn't the cedar bark pulled off in a foot wide strips? Why is it always one to two inch strips? Why is that? Are you weaving something? I don't know. I have a frick clue. The mystery, right? There's so many mysteries. So many things that I'm curious about. I'm so freaking stoked that you shared that and came forward, man. Please share the shit out of this and keep digging. Welcome to the club. <laughs> Welcome to the club. The club of no return. Hope to hear back from you again. I want to hear from all the forestry workers that are too insecure to share because they think they might get terminated. I'll keep you. I'll keep you secret. This is titled Sabe. Question mark. Quick email. Hi, Steve. Been watching your channel for years, and the experiences that others have shared made me realize that I might have had an unseen Sabe encounter. I live in Central Pennsylvania. Well, it's looking probable already. And there's lots of woods around here. A friend of mine asked me to go for a walk down this country path. It was a beautiful day. And the sun was starting to set. All around us was big trees and the path was grass. No rocks or branches. It felt like working through a forest maze. We walked maybe 50 feet when suddenly, out of nowhere, I tensed up and became immovable. That'd be creepy. My friend looked at me like I was nuts and asked what was wrong. I told him that we have to leave now. He asked why. I was upset that I wouldn't keep hiking. I told him I didn't know. I just knew we needed to leave now. He actually tried to pull me forward, but I was rooted in place and I couldn't budge. I had a sense of urgency, more like panic. I never experienced that before. I didn't smell or see anything. All I remember is that it was very quiet. Was that a sabe nearby? I have no idea. But I never go against my vibe, and I'm extremely in tune with the energies around me. I don't know if this will help anyone, but just in case, I thought I'd share. Thanks for all you do. You're the best. And to all, your, all, all, and to all our fellow knowers, I'm so glad everyone is waking up finally. Sincerely, Leah Taylor. Appreciate you, Leah. Um, just the fact that you shared that, and if somebody else has had that similar, they're gonna they're gonna share it now because of you, right? That's how it works. Got to go with your gut. Excuse me. No matter what, go with your gut. There's a T-shirt. <laughs> no matter what, go with your gut. Figure out the whys later. Once you're safe. And that's another thing too. I mentioned to everybody earlier in the past. What I feel is the appropriate move to do when something really bizarre or an absolute warning is going on is to retrace your steps backwards perfectly. Don't go off of that line of travel that you took before you started to shit yourself. Before the the the, the alarm, your natural before your natural alarm starts to rip, when it does, or you're frozen. Turn around and do not deviate off of that path you took. All right? You turn around and you go back the exact same way you came. That is my advice. If I could give any. For someone who may have that happen in the future. All right. I found a short one here. I think I've shared it before, but it's from a 12-year-old boy. I'm going to share it again just to be certain, all right? Hi Steve, my name is Caden. I'm 12 years old. My grandpa and me watch your channel all the time. I want to tell you about my encounter while camping close to Brian Head, Utah. So one night I was just sitting there in my tent in what looked to be a place where a deer had sat, but a spider fell on my head and it interested me. So sorry. <laughs> Shit. Oops. Sorry guys. But a spider fell on my head and it interested me. So I was shining my flashlight at it so I could see it moving around. I freaking hate spiders. <laughs> Give me a bear in thick bushes any time over big creepy spiders. 
My rain cover from the tent was off and my flashlight died. So I was going to go to sleep, but I couldn't because I kept hearing footsteps like sound of people stepping on sticks. The sound happened like every one or so minutes. And then I just said, screw it, I'm going to bed. Closed my eyes for a while until I heard rustling. So I opened my eyes to see a huge figure standing right outside of my tent. It seemed to be staring right down at me through the top of the tent. It was pitch black, but I could see it because of the reflection of the moon. Except for any human-like features, all I saw was the figure. And at my age, all I could think of was hiding under my sleeping bag. But I checked to see if it was just a tree or not, but... But though tree had any outline, but no tree had any outline, even similar to the figure. And I couldn't sleep for about four hours after seeing that. Then the next day I told my grandpa what had happened that night. And he said, you're not sleeping in that damn tent tonight. You'll be sleeping in the camper. My grandpa believed, believes me because he had his own encounter when he was young. It freaks me out to sleep in a tent from now on. If you read my story, thank you for what you're doing. It will help a lot of people. We need to get the word out there that the Sabe are real and not some made up fairy tale. Kenneth, appreciate you, man. I might have shared it before. And I, if I did share it before, I probably asked you to, uh, I probably asked you to s get your grandpa to, to share what he knows. All right. And even if he has to tell you and you can write us and share it with us, give her, buddy. Send it to us. All right. Keep everybody talking. It's very important. All right, I'm just going down trying to find stuff that I haven't shared. All right, here we go. This is titled Skunk Ape. Hey Steve, my name is Art Franco. This is an older one, you guys, I believe. Is there a date here? No, this is an older one though. My name is Art Franco and you can tell everyone my name. I live here in North Florida, Jacksonville to be exact. I'm a lifelong coon hunter, and I currently build boat docks and boat houses through the swamps off the St. John's River system. Most people here haven't a clue what's going on with these things, and I do my best to warn them, especially a customer who has kids playing or fishing off the docks we build. All will listen because I won't shut up about it, but no one believe. I always tell the kids when or if I get to see them while we are building, and do it in a way that doesn't give them nightmares. I'll tell them to be careful while on or around these docks because of bears who might want to hang out under the docks trying to find food and always check before you walk out on them. Some of the docks we build are 600 feet long and that's a long way to run or if one of these things gets between them and their house. The black bears here aren't too big or aggressive but I've heard screams and other sounds that ain't no bear, panther, coyote, or a manatee, since they don't make a sound. Some of these swamps are nasty and thick and full of gators, and though I haven't had a face-to-face -face encounter, I know what I hear and smell. We do hear trees come down from time to time, mostly cypress, and ain't no man knocking these things down. They're too big, and the crack of one splitting is loud. I told a few ass faces that since you don't believe me, just let me duct tape you to a cypress tree for the night, and I'll come peel you off the next, in the tree in the morning. No takers yet. I know these things exist, and I appreciate what you do for the people with encounters. Or just know that they're out there, scaring the hell out of them. Here in North Florida, I'm doing my best to get the word out, and I'm not going to shut up about it. Stay safe in your part of the world that I'm very jealous of. Sincerely, the big man with the bigger mouth, Art. <laughs> okay, Art. Keep going, buddy. Keep going. Maybe share the maybe share the videos with um, with the people who you want to have access to the knowledge. Okay, what's this? This has been read. I've read that. I know I read that one. Ooh, here we go. All right. Mark, this is red. I hope I didn't share it because I'm, I'm again, I'm looking at the older column, you guys, all right? 
Moose calling and scapula scraping slash wood knocking brings a visitor. That suck. Sounds vaguely familiar. Hi, Steve. I'm Lee Crawford. Feel free to use my name. I don't give an F about what anyone thinks. I've written him before about an earlier experience, so here's another one in the series. It was mid-September 06 in Ninilchik, Alaska. N-I-N-I-L-C-H-I-K, Alaska, that this event occurred. I was in the process of clearing my 10 acres of land about two miles outside of town, tucked away in the Ninilchik River Valley. It was my custom to work from sun up to sundown, clearing the land from downed beetle-killed spruce trees, then relax around the campfire listening to music and having a few beers to unwind before retiring to my travel trailer to do the same the next day. As this was moose hunting season here, I would stop work occasionally, give a moose grunt or two, and scrape on a spruce tree a few times, and then give the tree a couple of good whacks with the scapula, and occasionally with a three-inch diameter and five-foot branch. This is about the best way to call in bulls, as far as I'm concerned, unless you have a shed antler in your hand. This, as you know, is mimicking the sound of a bull moose that a bull moose makes while carrying on his business. I knew this would work well, as the year before I called in a rather large 60 plus inch bull using this technique. Unfortunately, I did not get the bull. Didn't present a good shot, but hope this year would be different. Anyway, as darkness fell and it was past good light, I sat down in my camp chair next to my cooler of cold moose head lager and turned on my CD player to listen to a little Alison Krauss and Union Station. Nothing could have been better for me. I watched the flames of my campfire, dreaming of just how I was going to sell this 120 or so cords of wood, make bank, and buy material to build my house the following year. As I was in about my third or fourth beer, I got the feeling like someone or something was watching me. I didn't feel any I didn't feel any real fear at the time, as I had my 4570 leaned up against the tree stump I was sitting next to. I also had a fairly powerful mag light that lit up anywhere it was pointed sufficiently, and my trailer was only 20 feet away. I stood up, turned on the mag light, and pointed it in the direction I was sensing the vibes, from which happened to be towards a pile of logs I had stacked up with an excavator a little over six feet high. I was perpendicular to the pile so I could see both ends. As I pointed the light beam to the right end of the pile, I saw what can only be described as a large black fur covered football or rugby ball, but a bit larger, a little more than 12 to 14 inches across with very large reddish eyes glaring at me. It looked like a very large black cat with its back arched and cone head shaped. I was thinking to myself, that's the biggest cat I've ever seen. And just how the F is his eyes so big and far apart? Four to five inches between them? All I could see was the top of his slash her head, but from that distance, 10, 11 meters or so. I panned the light to the left end of the pile and then came immediately back and it was still there. But when shining directly at its eyes, they blinked once. It reminded me of how the Grinch's eyes were in the Dr. Seuss book. Very mean and menacing. That's kind of weird, eh? If, you are, if you're familiar with eyes reflecting in light, in our light at all. I've never seen a reflected eyeball in my life that had shape. You know, like slanting shape. It's just a, it's just glowing, a glowing light source. So that's kind of bizarre, right? Excuse me. I was thinking I didn't want to piss this cat off, as I felt I was beginning to do. So pan the light left again and then back, at which point it was gone. As the music was still playing, a wee bit loud, I didn't hear it depart. I had no idea that this could be a sabe, as I hadn't really looked into it at the time and believed them to be further south. I say this as I had a possible chance encounter several years ago in Oregon while hiking in the Willamette National Forest when encountering two hikers running down the mountain trail as we were going up it. 
they were throwing off cameras and rucksacks and anything else not needed to beat feet out of the area with fear in their eyes yelling Bigfoot. Wow. However, I saw another one between Paxson and Glen Allen, Alaska, along the Richardson Highway in 2016. A very tall, nine foot plus feet and skinny coal black one reaching into the top of a tree, maybe after bird's nest? From about 90 feet away. I know they're real, they exist, and no one can convince me otherwise. Thanks for all you do, Steve. We the people appreciate it. Lee Crawford. Wow. There you go, Lee. Welcome to the club. And keep us posted. Keep us posted. All right. What do we got here? How long is this one? It's pretty long. Pretty long for this late in the video, but you know what? I'm going to go for it. I'm going to share this one. And then I'm going to go pack. Oh, man, see? It's not a good idea to put glasses on the outside of my cap. There we go. How's that? Here we go. Not for the faint of heart. Title is email. Steve, you can call me Red Man. Please read this off camera first, then decide if it should be shared with the group to tell this. I have to start at the beginning and I will have to talk about very personal things. Go to places I've kept hidden in my heart and soul for a long time. Some of this is not for the faint of heart. You've been warned. A little, about, a little bit about me now. I grew up every morning taking a deep breath, thank God, for another day. Then hug all three of my dogs slash best friends, then hit the ground running. I'm a hard-working good guy. I believe in right and wrong. I do not drink or, know, or do drugs. The word is my bond. If I have ever called you friend or brother, you earned it. And I'll be there when you need me. Enough about me. This is about what I know and have experienced slash seen firsthand that may help someone else. It all started when I was a young child. My dad had just parked and got out of the car and was walking to the house. I ran out to meet him as I always did. Right before I got to him, I noticed some movement from my left and looked to see what it was. It was a man walking toward my dad and raising up something. He yelled at my dad as he turned around and the man had a sawed off double barreled shotgun up. As he did this, I looked right into his eyes. There was pure evil in his eyes and no hesitation. As I watched him, he pulled the trigger and there was an explosion. My dad spun around and fell to the ground. I felt something wet hit my face and started to scream and cry, still looking this man in the eyes. In an instant, I knew what pure evil was and looked like. Wow. My whole world was destroyed. My mom came running out and grabbed me up and she was screaming and crying also. Everything seemed to slow down as I watched this man slowly turn and point the shotgun directly at me and my mom. As I was looking into his eyes, he pulled the trigger and nothing happened. He continued to stare directly at me, the evil I saw. Then things started to speed up again. As the neighbors were running outside to see what was happening, the man turned around and ran away. I remember all the blood screaming and crying. At the time, I did not realize how witnessing my dad's murder would change me forever. That's pretty heavy, man. That's unfortunate. I still have the newspaper clippings of it all and the trail and the trial. The changes this caused in me, my survival instincts kicked in. After this, I cried a lot and just quit talking. For two and a half years, I never spoke a word. During this time, I lived inside my head. As a child, I was so afraid that the evil I now knew was real and hiding, just out of sight, waiting for the right time to come kill me. I started to pay attention to every detail of everything around me. I did not want to stand out or draw any attention to myself as the evil would come kill me. At night I would never really sleep. It was like my brain was in overdrive thinking back over all the details from the previous day. I think at this time I started to develop some of the abilities we have lost over time. For me to be able to survive this, it's crazy I know, but it did not take long for me to start to notice that things were changing. In school things started to become easy for me. It was like I could remember everything. I started to notice rhythms and cycles in everything around me. 
slowly at first, then over time faster. The thing is, I realized slowly that no one else seemed to notice them. And then I started to feel and sense things like when people were near me, but I could not see them yet. Over time, I now can feel their presence from a good distance. I seemed to know what they were thinking or going to say before they spoke. I knew this was not normal, and I was afraid to let people know about any of this. It was bad enough in school, as a skinny, shy, pale kid that did not want to talk and had no dad. In life, I've noticed that one thing leads to another and so on. So this is how I first felt the presence of the hidden ones, as I call them, and how they became aware of me. After my dad's murder, my mom, younger brother, and I had to move in with my grandparents, who lived on a farm. I'd go behind the barn to the woods and sit and think about my dad and cry almost every day. I found quite a place. I found a quiet place and would sit down and close my eyes and open my mind and think about him and start to cry and I would fall asleep. My grandpa would come pick me up and carry me into the house, put me into bed. After a while, I began to ever so, after a while, I began to ever so slightly, I began to feel a presence in the distance. When I opened my mind, slowly over time, I began to move closer. I think it was an older female that was drawn to my presence by the sorrow it felt and the sound of me crying, possibly her mothering instincts. As the summer went on, I began to have odd dreams of picked up and held and at times being rocked. I just thought it was a dream. Then at dinner one evening, my grandmother told me that I was going to have to stop falling asleep in the barn. I was getting too big for grandpa to carry in every night and put me to bed. I just looked up at her. I just looked up at her and was shocked. I was falling asleep in the woods, not in the barn. It scared the crap out of me. Those dreams came flooding back. That's when I knew that the hidden ones were real. I never fell asleep in the woods again, but I could feel that presence off in the distance from time to time. And over time, I realized that I was being watched over. What is now known as being tagged. The abilities I learned as a child have stayed with me to this very day and have gotten stronger. And I've developed some more after I opened my mind and accepted the truth slash reality that is out there. I've had encounters with the hidden ones all through my life and they continue to this very day. Far too much for one message. I'm willing to share it all if the group is interested. I'm in no way an expert on any of this. I'm just a hardworking guy who has learned a few things. I think it's safe to say the hard way. The owl man is correct about the crying in the woods. I'm living proof, lol. My grandfather was not able to understand why his chickens would not at times lay no eggs and at other times lay a lot of eggs, I knew. But at that time, I still was not able to talk, to tell him, and then have to explain. I've always felt bad about that. I often wonder if he knew just a feeling. My mother and grandparents knew I was not like the other kids in a lot of ways. My grandfather would hide his tools from me. If not, I would take things apart and put them back together over and over again. There are times when I could feel their presence outside of my bedroom. I'd think in my head, I know you're there. Thank you for watching over me. And they never answered me. But I would get a feeling they understood. And then they would leave. The next thing that comes to mind was a few years later. I was in the bathtub taking a bath and I got that feeling that someone was nearby I did not recognize. My brother had come into the bathroom and he was waiting to get his bath next. I leaned over and told him that something slash someone was outside the bathroom window. That I was going to jerk the curtains back and look out through the window and see who it was before they could hide. So I jerked the curtains open and put my face against the glass to look out. When I did, I screamed and fell backwards and hit my head on the tub, edge cutting the back of my head. That's not good. There on the other side of the glass was a huge man-slash-ape-like face pressed against the glass looking me right in the eyes, and it had glowing red eyes. It scared the crap out of me. Me and my brother were, were screaming and crying, running through the house, were met by my mom and stepdad and a friend of theirs who was visiting. They turned and ran outside looking for what it was, but no one but 
but no one in sight anywhere. I've not done that again to this day. Lesson learned, lol. Not funny then, but now. I took, it took a bit to get the cut on the back of my head to stop bleeding. I don't think it wanted to hurt me. I would have sensed danger, but did not. I have things I need to get done, as I'm sure you do also. I'll write in with more of the things I've experienced that may help someone, if the group wants to hear more. Steve, keep up the good work, my brother. Red man. Red man? I'm sitting on the edge of my seat waiting for more. And I'll guarantee you, you probably, if you read the comments under the video, I guarantee you there's going to be a whole pile of people saying, Red man, share it all, man. Share it all. Please share it all. What an unfortunate experience you have as a child. That sucks. Thankfully, you push forward and you're here with us, enjoying your life. It's a good thing, man. Got to keep learning, keep going, never give up, never quit, right? Red man's a good example. I am very, very interested to, to learn what you have learned, for sure. So make sure you email us back, all right, man? Now, I got to go. It's pouring rain. <laughs> you pack up all my stuff. I'd be lying if I didn't admit, if I didn't say that, uh, you know, it's always this stage of the game before I go is when I, if I get anxiety about going solo into the mountains, long ways away, this is when I get my, I start thinking, oh, I hope everything's going to be cool. I hope I run anything. I hope I'm going to be all right. You know, that make any sense. <laughs> and then, but once I'm doing, it's really weird because I'll have the anxiety here at home is where I might have, if I get anxiety about being solo in the middle of nowhere, this is when I get it right now before I go. On the way there, hmm, not really. While I'm doing it, obviously, no. Isn't that weird? I wonder why that is. The second I get into those mountains, those woods, and start hiking into that big, mature timber that's never been logged before, getting way back in there alone, I'm 100% at ease. I'm good. Isn't that weird? You'd think it'd be the opposite. You know, stoked, I'm excited to go. But right now is when I might get little hints of, and I hope nothing's going to happen. I hope this isn't the trip. I'm not into this. Just leave me alone. Uh, I hope this goes us. I hope this goes smooth. You know. Except when I'm there doing it, then I'm all good. I'm actually really, really into it. But anyway, on the positive note, I've got 14 trail cameras I left in the North Country before. They've been what, soaking for a couple few weeks. I can't. I can't wait to see what's on those trail cameras. That's that's always exciting for me. And I hope this hunt goes smooth, make it home one piece. And I take all you guys with me. I don't know where I'm going to share from next, but I'm probably going to do it live with my mobile internet. This will be the last, I shouldn't say the last video. <laughs> Today's video. Next video will either be live from the middle of nowhere or pre-recorded from the middle of nowhere. All the people that shared today, thank you so much for being brave and honest. Very appreciated. Every single person out there is very appreciated. Who's come forward here? Share my story at howtohunt.com. Word for word. It's where it's, it's where uh, it's shared word for a word and details withheld on upon request, no matter what. I guess I gotta return these to Sarah. I think she said, somebody emailed in, looked for the white ones, and I said, would you out of these white ones? She goes, no, I think I gotta put more in stock. I'm like, we'll put them all in stock, <laughs> you know? But she does have some more of these. Black camo, mm -hmm. that's kind of a cool one. Subtle, cool, and the white snow camo. Hopefully it's warm, not too, too cold, and I can utilize the white one this week. It's snowing up there right now. I'll be back shortly.